Welcome firefighters. I hope you all had a fabulous May Day and found a way to show your support and appreciation for workers and laborers around the world. Wherever you're watching on whatever platform, drop your name and where you're joining from in the comments. I, you know, I love hearing from you. And uh, so it's, I really, really would like you to do that. And to those of you joining us for the first time, and I hope there are some of you, welcome to the Fire Drill Fridays family, where we're building community, learning about the climate crisis and taking action to address it. And you can see lots of ways to take action and get involved at firedrillfridays.com slash take action. Each of you can help our movement grow by sharing today's show so your friends and colleagues can join the movement. So please take a moment now and hit the share button. You know, each time you spread the message and take action online and offline, our movement gets a lot stronger. So as many of you know, um, May 1st is International Workers Day. It's also known as May Day and is celebrated around the world as a day of action and showing solidarity across movements. In honor of May Day, we're gonna be joined today by two inspiring guests to talk about the labor movement, the climate crisis, and what it took or what it will take to ensure that workers and communities are fully supported in the transition away from fossil fuels you know, supported for a just and equitable transition. That's what's important. But first, should we have some good news? Our first piece of good news comes by way of a Greenpeace special report from Ocean's campaign director, my friend John Hosevar, calling in from Chile to tell us about the incredible work he's doing to build support for ocean sanctuaries. Hi, Jane. Hello. In Chile with the Arctic sunrise, we've just come back from almost two months at sea. We've been building support for ocean sanctuaries. This is really important because, as you know, our oceans are in real trouble. And ocean sanctuary populations to protect ocean biodiversity, to survive things like climate change, ocean acidification, industrial fishing, and plastic pollution. And it was amazing. We uh, have been using the submarine, which you can't quite see from here, uh, but it's a two-person submarine. It goes down to 2,000 feet. And we were working with an amazing team of scientists to survey the seafloor in places where no one has ever been before. We went, we think, farther south than any other research subdive in history. And what we found was really surprising. In areas where they'd almost always been covered by ice, uh, in places where the sun has literally never penetrated, we found areas completely covered with all kinds of diverse marine creatures. Uh, starfish, corals, sponges, all kinds of weirder marine biology stuff, uh, tuna kits. Um, it, was, it was really something, very diverse. If you didn't know better, you'd think it was a tropical coral reef. And the reason that we were there, obviously to build support for ocean sanctuaries, but specifically this year is an incredible opportunity. The United Nations is negotiating a global ocean treaty. And if we get that right, it's going to enable us to scale up sanctuaries for the first time. Right now we have maybe 2% of the world's oceans protected, and we need to get to 30% by 2030 and build from there. And if we get this treaty right, it's going to enable us to do that. At the same time, the commission in charge of protecting Antarctic waters is considering two proposals that would create the largest ocean sanctuaries in the world. So these dives, the work that we've been doing in Antarctica, will help strengthen these proposals and build support and hopefully we'll be able to get them done this year. One of the amazing things about Antarctic waters is that we can also get them protected directly without some big political process 
if we're able to show that there are the kinds of species that indicate a vulnerable marine ecosystem. And in our 12 research dives, I would say 11 of them, we have a pretty decent case of getting them designated as vulnerable marine ecosystems. And that means they're protected pretty much automatically. So it's amazing, powerful stuff. From Antarctica, we went straight out to Argentina's Blue Hole. And this is an area 200 miles or more offshore. Uh, it's a biodiversity hotspot, but unfortunately, there's no regulation whatsoever out there. And so it's become also a hotspot of human rights abuses, of labor violations, uh, even murder at sea, as well as pirate fishing and enormous destruction of, of uh, seafloor habitats. So we brought the Arctic Sunrise and this incredible team with the submarine to see if we could document these seafloor habitats and show people what's at stake. Unfortunately, the weather did not really cooperate. We had currents, we had winds, we had waves. Uh, we actually weren't able to get in any diving at all. We still did some important work, but it really just showed how difficult it is to do the kinds of work that we do at Greenpeace. Um, and I think this is really important because we call it Earth, but it's the water planet. It's really not realistic to have to document these special places and show why this is so special that it deserves, deserves to be protected. The default needs to be, look, this is the ocean. It's important for our survival. We need to protect it. Maybe we allow some fishing in some areas in some ways, but they have to make the case. Not we have to go and bring ships and submarines somewhere and then prove that this is special enough to think about protecting it. We need to flip that around. So. That's why we're here. That's what we've been doing. I'm feeling really good about our chances to get a strong global ocean treaty. We're going to keep fighting. We need your help. Uh, so stay with us and uh, we'll see what we can do this summer. And then in October, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens at the Antarctic Ocean Commission. So thank you and uh, it's good to see you. Oh, thanks, John. God, what incredible and important work you're doing. I can only imagine how profound it must be to go down in that submarine. I'll be sure to check back in with you for an update about the oceans, the, the Global Oceans Treaty later this year. Thanks again. And other exciting news, this is really fabulous. Last Friday, Greenpeace activists joined the picket line led by United Steelworkers Local 5 union members in their struggle for a fair labor contract from their employer, Chevron. The new boat picket line, that's new, expanded the picket line from land into the San Francisco Bay. It included two Greenpeace boats with striking refinery workers, Greenpeace activists, United Steelworkers flags and picket signs, and a banner that called on Chevron to give these workers a fair contract now. As a fossil fuel tanker approached the refinery, the oil workers radioed to ask if they could Though the tanker ended up passing through, the alliances that we are building towards justice for workers and the planet are growing stronger by the minute and so fundamentally important. The action took place as Chevron announced in its quarterly meeting that its profits quadrupled in the first three months of 2022, quadrupled to 6.3 billion dollars. Yet it's far from using those profits to pay its workers a fair wage. <laughs> Wouldn't Workers shouldn't have to go on strike to get a fair treatment from greedy fossil fuel companies making record profits, right? The only way that we can break these companies' stranglehold on our wallets, our communities, and the planet is by standing together and demanding a livable future and by getting rid of elected officials who take money from the fossil fuel companies and replacing those with climate champions so that we can get decent legislation passed. One of our core objectives here at Fire Drill Fridays is to bring about the just transition to a renewable energy economy, right? That 
an economy that addresses social and environmental injustices. So I just I want to spend just a little time talking about what we mean when we say a just transition. There's not only one definition for this term. You know, environmental justice communities, workers, labor movement leaders have used it at different times over the decades, often to articulate their version of what it would look like to ensure their communities were supported through economic transitions. When we think about a just transition to a sustainable society, we need to ensure that there are good paying, safe, dependable union jobs or union equivalent jobs for workers to, to transition to as the fossil fuel industry continues to collapse and laying off masses of people during each downturn the way they did during the pandemic. Workers in the fossil fuel industry have incredible skills, and many of them have advanced training. Now, as these workers are seeking additional training and certifications to apply their skills to different fields, there needs to be funds available to support them. Wage replacement guarantees and health benefits are a necessary and critical part of this transition. You know, history is littered with irresponsible and unjust economic transitions. The booms and busts at the whims of the corporate elite have had devastating consequences on communities and workers. So to end this cycle, we must lift up and support workers and labor union leaders who are advocating for a better, more just way of doing business, right? A future with good union jobs and climate action is increasingly being realized in communities across the country and across the world. It is all of our responsibility to make sure that the right steps are being taken and programs like the ones outlawed, outlined above are put into place as we continue to call for urgent action on climate. One inspiring example of this is the Texas Climate Jobs Project, a major new program at the Texas AFL-CIO that was launched last August and that set the goal of creating more than 1.1 million solid middle-class jobs in the coming years in wind and solar generation while protecting the livelihoods of workers who are transitioning from fossil fuel work. A proactive group of 27 unions representing a cross-section of the labor movement in Texas published a report offering proposals aimed at intersecting crises of the pandemic, you know, income inequality and the worsening climate crisis. That is more evidence that our movements are aligned and growing in strength. Together, we can imagine and fight for a world where we all thrive. You know, increasing numbers of Americans are alarmed about the climate crisis. And at the same time, support for union is at its highest since 1965. A recent Gallup poll shows that 68% of Americans approve of unions. Many of you have probably heard of the powerful victory of the Amazon labor union. After years of union busting tactics, Chris Smalls and his team persevered against one of the biggest retailers in the world, inspiring countless of others to organize. We've also seen and been inspired by the wave of organizing by Starbucks worker, workers winning dozens of votes to unionize, store by store by store. These workers organizing on the shop floor are giving us hope for a future with good union jobs across industries and sectors. No matter what industry you work in, these, these wins are good for everybody. You know, more union jobs means rising wages, better benefits, and improved working conditions across the entire economy. What cannot go unnoticed is the wave of people power drawn to authentic movements and leaders.
that are demanding an economy and a future where we can flourish. And here to talk with us about the nuances and, and opportunities of growing the natural alliance between environmental activists and labor rights activists are two longtime heroes of social justice, Rick Levy and Afari Gabre. Teferi Gabre is the Chief Program Officer of Greenpeace USA. Teferi has over 30 years of experience in coalition building, activism, and organizing in the labor movement. His impressive track record demonstrates success in mobilizing and uniting everyone from faith leaders to labor activists to racial justice and immigration groups around the causes that he's worked on. Teferi served in leadership roles at the AFL-CIO and the Orange County Labor Federation before joining Greenpeace. Teferi is responsible for driving the campaign work at Greenpeace USA and is focused on building one of the strongest, most diverse and broadest coalition in its history. Now, Rick Levy is the president of the Texas AFL-CIO. As president, Rick has focused on helping to build a broader, bolder, and more inclusive labor movement to address the challenges faced by working people in Texas. <laughs> Texas. Under his tenure, the Federation has led the fight against legislative and political attacks on the labor movement, as well as introducing significant initiatives to build worker power in Texas. Oh, welcome to you both. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. It's so amazing to be here, Jane. Thank you so very Thank much you. for having us and for laying out the issues like you just did. I'm, I could listen to that for quite a while. <laughs> for each of you, I would love to hear um, what you think about the growing support for unions and the inspiring actions at Starbucks and Amazon. Rick, why don't you start? Okay, I'm just, uh, I'm totally excited by it. Um, some of the most fun I've ever had is going into my neighborhood Starbucks and ordering my coffee and saying my name is Union Proud and having the uh, folks call out my order. I have an order for Union Proud and, uh, and just seeing the excitement that is generated by workers realizing that they have it in their power to change the way things are. That's, you know, that's the biggest challenge that we face is people thinking that the way things are is the way it will always have to be. And I think when you see workers organizing like they do at Starbucks or Amazon, it breaks that seal of inevitability and lets people know that, hey, I can do something about the problems that I'm facing. And just seeing that catch fire as more and more workers realize that the system, they don't have to put up with the system that's rigged against them. There's a way to fight back. And that's by standing with the people that work right next to you. And so I'm, uh, I have, uh, I'm just, totally excited about this historical moment and just uh, trying to do everything we can to support it. Oh, beautifully said. Beautifully said, Rick. How about you, Teferi? What are your thoughts on this new upswing yeah, I'm, union movement? I'm into everything that Rick said. Um, I, I think I, I believe, uh, Jane, that this is just the scratching the surface. Uh, I think workers have been ready for the union for a long time. Yeah. Uh, they just needed uh, um, uh, a boost to actually uh, um, uh, realize your own power. And what's exciting about what's happening at both um, Amazon and at Starbucks is these are, you know, fact, you know, shop level organizers who actually are organizing their, their, their unions. And that should give us a signal like in how we have to trust communities and how we have to trust workers themselves to actually figure out what's right for them. Um, instead of, you know, uh, using memos and, and scientific data and all that stuff, it's not that difficult. It is um, uh, workers know what is in their right, what their labor is worth and how to demand it. And we're seeing from the Starbucks CEO to everybody else scratching their heads and just saying, where did we go wrong? Um, unfortunately, corporate America went wrong a long time ago. And their power was unchallenged for a long time. And now workers are saying enough is enough. 
and I'm standing for my right. And it is really exciting to be alive at this time when we're seeing revival at, at the street level. Yeah, it's true of teachers too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Tiferi, how do you understand the interconnectedness of the labor movement and the environmental movement? I mean, how, how and how do you think the relationship has changed in the last 10 years? Well, I think we're getting to a greater understanding, uh, Jane, that we're one and the same. Um, uh, it's not by accident. It, it is corporations and their billions of dollars. They have been trying to actually divide us um, by giving us false choices, uh, by saying either you breathe clean air or you get a good paycheck. You don't get both. Uh, I think people are realizing that it's not one or the other. I demand both. I'm worth both, and I'm going to get both. And that's how uh, we're coming together. Um, but I'll be frank with you. Um, when I was in Orange County, when I was at the California Labor Federation, most of the time where I met environmentalists was usually at city council meetings, sitting on the opposite side of the aisle. And I always scratched my head to say, how come we didn't meet before now? These are the same neighbors. These are the same people. Um, uh, just strategically being driven apart by corporations uh, to take advantage, both of us. And, you know, it takes all of us to realize that. It takes all of us to realize the power we have when we join together, when we join arms and fight what's right for all of us. And that is not compromising, but demanding good paying jobs that does protect the planet and a planet that my five-year-old daughter can grow on. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's so important that environmentalists make it clear that we stand up for the, for the fossil fuel workers so that, that the companies can't drive that wedge between us. It's really destructive. Rick, last August, Texas AFL-CIO launched the groundbreaking that I just mentioned, the Texas Climate Jobs Project. Right. Tell, tell us about the project. What spurred it and how's it going? It's, it's some of the most exciting work that I think we've ever engaged in, Jane. And it's, um, <clears throat> it actually started out of conflict, um, imagine that. Um, we were having these huge fights with each other in the labor movement about candidates to support. You know, we'd have candidates that on the one hand were extremely pro-labor, but had a very strong message on the Green New Deal. And we would have these fights about, you know, can we support these candidates? And we, a year ago, we actually supported two candidates who were very strongly pro-labor, but also, um, you know, were supporting very strong climate action. And we had some of our unions get very upset about it. Um, that they felt like it was really wrong that the Texas AFL-CIO would be supporting candidates who, as they saw it, whose main goal was to put them out of work. And so it became clear that we could not, you know, we have very heavy membership in the fossil fuel industries in the state of Texas. And so we historically didn't really deal with the issue of climate. Um, but it became clear that the world is changing around us. Um, and we can either be part of that conversation or we can just allow change to be shaped without us. So what I did was we challenged the folks who uh, were upset and the entire union movement to come together and say, look, there are crises going on in this country and in the state that we all cannot ignore. One is the climate crisis. We see the weather patterns. We see the imperative that we address climate change. But we also see the crisis in people's jobs and their standards, and we see the crisis of inequality and challenged each other to sit in a room and figure out what it is we can do together to address those multi intersecting crises. And for a year, that's what we did. We learned, you know, we had unions who worked in power plants, we had unions who worked in uh, as janitors, we had unions who were nurses, we had unions who built. Um, major construction projects. And we all got in a room and we said, sometimes solidarity means you show up at somebody's picket line um, when they're on strike, but sometimes solidarity means sitting in a room with people uh, that you have something in common with and figuring it out how you can move forward together. And so we came out with our report that you referenced that says, look, here's this historical moment where we can create over a million new union jobs and 
do what we need to do to uh, reduce global warming and reduce, globe, and reduce uh, harmful emissions. And these are not contradictory goals. These are the same goal, like Tafari was saying, this is not either or, this is like, here is our path forward. And so we founded the organization, um, unions are supporting it, also foundations and private donors are uh, supporting it. People who believe in the future of workers and environment together are supporting it. Um, and we're running campaigns to decarbonize our schools. We're running campaigns to uh, build offshore wind in the Gulf of Mexico. We're running campaigns to encourage hydrogen and geothermal. And it all rests around the notion that if workers are leading the conversation on climate change, then we can make the kind of changes that we need, uh, both politically and um, in the workplace. So Beautiful. that's what we're doing. Thank you for those words. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's important for activists in the climate movement to know that not all climate jobs are good for workers, right? I mean, can you tell us your view on what makes a climate job a good job and what makes you so excited about the potential for the good climate jobs in Texas? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, to me, a good job is a job that you have a living wage, you have health care, you have a pension, and you have dignity and respect on the job. You have a voice on the job. In short, a union job. And I think you're, you know, one of the things that I will just say that is really important for, in my opinion, um, you know, it's not like, I mean, I've, I feel some responsibility that we've been very late to this conversation in a way to be, so I'm not getting on a high horse, but it's also true that um, that what you just said, that environmentalists really need to take seriously the notion of what the role of the workers are in this process. We've encountered, you know, we've had conversations with lots of folks that are environmentalists and, you know, we're trying to build this new energy economy. And, and, and you know, it's when I go to a steel worker or somebody who works in a refinery and I say, hey, this is our program to, you know, create these new energy jobs. Um, you can be a solar installer and you can make half of what you make now and you may or may not have a pension. So that sounds like a great program, doesn't it? Um, and the answer is no. Um, and so to really build the political power that we need, we need the labor movement to take seriously the struggles of our climate. But we also need the environmental community to take seriously. So when we try to get labor standards um, as being required in, you know, when government spends money on construction projects that are gonna be climate projects, that those labor standards are mandatory. And we need environmentalists to understand that they have to support that too. Because unless we can support, like you said at the very beginning, unless we figure this stuff out together, we're all gonna be wandering uh, separately for a long time. Right. So how, how, how is it that with union support at a 20 year high, that union membership is remaining steady rather than increasing. Tafari, what do you think? Well, I, I, I think um, it's simple. Um, our labor laws are broken in this country. Um, corporations are allowed to break the law and not get punished at all. Uh, some of the worst things that happens to corporations for union busting or breaking the labor law is that they have to post a note in the lunchroom that they were found to be guilty. Every corporation takes that chance. Every corporation takes that chance. So we have to struggle together to actually improve our labor laws. And the same politicians, Jane, who protect uh, uh, people who are polluting our economy are the same politicians also who protect, who protect those who are stealing from workers every day those who deny workers their rightful right to organize their workplaces and demand for justice at, uh, at, at their workplaces. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, uh, it's, it's a system and we need system change. Um, but at the same time, system change is not gonna happen just because we lobby in Washington DC. It has to be people power. And how we harness what's happening at Starbucks how we harness what's happening at uh, uh, Amazon, how, it, you know, in every newsroom in this country, yeah, it, you know, uh, uh, what, what's happening. 
is really, really crucial, not only just for the labor movement, for our democracy in general in this, uh, the, the, in, in this country. Um, uh, that's why it is an exciting movement to be in, but we also should not fool ourselves that the other side is just gonna take it sitting down. Um, you know, getting a union, a union at your workplace is one thing. Getting a union contract is another thing. And we all have to, you know, roll our sleeves and go help Chris, uh, Chris Malls and uh, the Starbucks workers, not only to organize a workplace, but that make sure they get a union contract. They get the first contract. Uh, companies are masters at this um, in how to find a way to lengthen union contracts until they break the workers' will. And we cannot allow that to happen. But that's the reason. It's our loss, our really broken loss, protected by a flowbuster um, that are not allowing us to actually uh, advance forward. Mm -hmm. So listen, um, gonna ask you both a favor. Um, I, I'm going to Italy to make a movie. When I come back around late July and I'm gonna be going on the road with Fire Drill Fridays, um, traveling to hot spots around the country, if there are places where the Fire Drill Fridays firefighters um, can join me in support of union struggles, would you let us know? Because I think the more that the climate activists can show up on picket lines, show up to support struggling workers, the better. So will you help us find, you know, know when, when the opportunities arise? I will, absolutely. I mean, I was a little disappointed. But no, I mean, <laughs> we, we could, uh... You'll yeah. help us do that, Tafari, to too. Yeah, yeah de definitely. I can't wait until, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, until I join you hopefully in a bus and roll into a union hall and, you know, talk to the workers themselves yeah. without exactly. the filtrations that goes through their leaders or anything, just directly talk to workers themselves. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I can't wait actually to do that. That's great. And I know that our firefighters that are watching are going to are going to want to do that. So, um what are the challenges we face in creating opportunities for the workers' movements and climate movements to work together where we have common grounds? I mean, what ideas do you have to overcome those, those challenges? It's yeah. Both of you. Um, go ahead, Tafari. You go. No, no, go ahead, Rick. You started already. <laughs> well, um, I mean, to me, it's a lot about understanding and it's about, you know, having a conversation about what we can do together. Um, it's about um, identifying um, projects and campaigns that we can work on together. Like one of the, I'll tell you what, Jay, God, uh, one of the most exciting things that I've ever heard about in our movement is, um, you know, like I told you, we're running these campaigns in some school districts around Texas to get schools to decarbonize. So to uh, put solar panels on, to... Um, uh, redo the HVAC systems so that they're more energy efficient and cleaner school environments to electrify the school buses and to do that using union labor um, so that the kids can see that there's a path to a career um, and they're working in their schools and apprentices are part of it. And um, so in, in building this campaign, um, we had in the room, we had construction trades, we had industrial trades, we had um, teachers and classified personnel, uh, but we also had Sierra Club, but we also had Sunrise Movement, and we also had, um, you know, environmentalists who understood that. Look, if if if, if uh, in that room there was so much power that when we come up to school board elections and we have environmentalists and labor working for the same candidates in a way that cannot divide us and distract us, um, we have actual measurable. Uh, uh, results that we know that the folks that we elect can actually implement, that's charting a completely new path mm -hmm. together where we may, maybe we can realize our power to, to lift wages, to lift working conditions, to show kids how they can have a path forward. And oh, by the way, 
uh, to do things that are really good for the environment. So it's campaigns like that where we can not fight. I mean, obviously we'll fight about certain things because I think you know we have certain interests that are different. But to really put the focus on what we can do moving forward into the future, I think is what we need to do. Beautiful. Tafari, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I'm into that. And in, in what I'm catching from Rick and, and I want to expand is um, really, in, you know, um, uh, Jane, ideas come to Washington, D.C. to die, not to live. Um, and we just have to make them live at the local level. And we have to be focused in our in, in our coalition building at the local level. Um, local Greenpeace activists working with local union activists at the local level and identifying actually what their needs are. Uh, that's what I think is gonna move the needle, uh, the, the needle forward. Um, and what we need is not just a campaign. We need a movement. We totally need a movement. Campaigns come and campaigns go. Movements keep going and keep, 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 keep rolling. Um, and also we can't be naive um, that the fossil fuel industry is not just gonna go away. They're gonna fight and they have billions to fight with. And we have to understand that. But the challenge for all of us is, can we have billions of people to actually defeat billions of dollars? Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to make those billions of dollars, but we should know how to organize millions of people actually to defeat those billions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there, there's a lot of opinions about the term just transition. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that some of the leaders of the AFL-CIO previously uh, were very suspect about the term. You know, it's a lot of words, but where's the reality? I'm wondering if each of you could share your thoughts on, on what that term just transition means for you. You want to start, Tafari? Yes, um, I was one of those people. Um, and let me tell you why that was. Um, and that is talking to each other over our heads, uh, not actually having in-depth in in -depth conversations. Um, uh, what does it look like? What does a just transition look like for someone who has been toiling and making sure our electricity is working by mining coal in West Virginia when their coal plant is closed. Having solar plants and solar farms in California does not help that person one bit at all. And it is how do we custom fit for incumbent workers to transition into uh, a just a transition job? And that has been the hardest thing to, 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 you know, to figure out. Um, uh, so, you know, a lot of union workers, a lot of workers heard the term just transition, but they didn't see the justness or the transition at all. And it became harder for labor leaders actually to mention that term because they were losing credibility with their rank and file members. And, and I think that's getting better. And the Texas, uh, uh, what their Rick and his team is doing in Texas is making that a lot more swallowable because Workers themselves at the ground level are being part of the conversation of actually what just transition look like. Right. And I was in the picket line at Chevron last week, you know, and I just with my cell, cell phone, I started videotaping some of the conversation I had with the workers. You know, uh, I asked them like Chevron advertises that they're processing algae and they're moving away from fossil fuels. And they said, they never saw that. I said, are they training you actually in what they're saying they're gonna transition to? They said, no. And one of them told me that I'm ab absolutely mindful. When they are done with us, they will just throw us away. So the workers are ready. We just have to go talk to them. We just have to go activate them and actually give them hope uh, into what they're gonna transition into. Right, great. How about you, Rick? What yeah, do you I mean, I, I, I remember very clearly a conversation that we were having as we were coming up with our plan. And um, when, when somebody said that when workers hear the term just transition, it sounds like a fancy funeral. Mm -hmm. um, and that there has never been, I think you referenced this in the beginning, Jane, and, and this is what workers know in their hearts, that it has never been in this country that a transition has been handled with anything that would be considered just. And workers all over the state of Texas see coal plants that have 
closed and then nothing else exists in these communities for people to do. They see aluminum smelters that have closed and a whole region um, suffers and nothing comes back. Um, certainly for them, and seen that repeated over and over with all kinds of industry throughout the state of Texas. So it's like, don't lie to me when you talk about a just transition, because that doesn't exist. It is possible. I just got back from meeting with folks in Germany. I met with the head of the German mining union, um, who is completely on board with the process to eliminate their use of coal by the year 2030. I mean, that's amazing, right? And we said, well, what's the deal with that? And he said, well, every worker who's 58 or older gets guaranteed access to early retirement. Um, and every worker that works in the field under the age of 58 is guaranteed to get the training and plugged into a union job in a new industry. Um, that's putting your money where your mouth is. Um, and look, in Texas, we're not going to get off of fossil fuels. Uh, you know, there's going to be a very long period where, you know, where we need fossil fuels to keep our lights on, to manufacture the things we need. We have to engage in strategies to lower the carbon output of those um, ent entities. And we need to make sure that we are putting in place systems so that people who are dislocated um, really believe um, and really uh, can show that they are being, being, their needs are being addressed. Look, these are folks that have worked in really tough jobs for a really long time to power this economy. And shame on us if we don't figure out how to put them first in this transition. Right. And, and, and Jane, just if I would add one, one more thing. Um, we saw how our government actually reacts when catastrophic situations happen because of COVID. We saw our government print trillions of dollars because of an emergency. What is more dangerous than actually losing our planet? And where is the action for that? What would it look like actually if our government said, uh, we will tax this fossil fuel industries and we will put a trillion dollars in a bond for incumbent workers actually to transition out. That guarantees their retirement, that secures their livelihood. That's doable. The thing is we need to have a labor movement and an environmental movement and the progressive movement that's bold enough to actually imagine that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Rick, you, you, you brought up Germany, that, that situation in Germany, Germany, which has, you know, it was a coal economy, right? Yeah. So the fact that they're phasing out of it is so um, fantastic. But the secret is everybody was at the table. That's exactly right. Companies, the unions, the workers, the communities, everybody was sitting there figuring out how to do it. That's, that's the ultimate. That's so true. And you, you know, in talking to the folks there, it's just, they looked at me like I was crazy when I said, was the union, you know, was the union involved in this? They said, of course, you know, that like the fact that that the workers were not at the table was like more than they could even imagine. It was yeah. like, yeah, it was. And, and, you know, they, we asked, I said, well, how do the members feel? And they were like, well, you know, folks who get to retire early at 58 aren't too upset about it. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, making sure that their interests were addressed. Yeah. So, so I'm seeing here a synergy of um, things that need to happen. We need to clean up our, politics in order for that to happen, like what we talked about in Germany, because they don't have billion dollar campaigns uh, that's financed by, by, by corporations so that you can have all those places in there. Yeah. We need to have a complete system change in how workers are allowed to organize in this country. Yeah. Heck, groups like Greenpeace are not almost not being allowed to protest. Uh, 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 because of the loss, in the, the, because of the loss in this country. So that's why I think we need to have a movement that actually demands system change and create a system that actually responds to regular people in this country, not to the elite. So we're building it, right? We're going to do this. Absolutely. No choice. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> What are some other stories that we should know about, Rick? I'm curious about the, the people that are inspiring you in the labor climate movement in Texas and 
and the campaigns that you know that are underway that might open our eyes about what's possible in Texas. Yeah, um, you know, all over the state, you know, J all over the state, you have people working at the grassroots, and I'll, I'll, I'll just. Um, you know, one of the things Tafari said is we don't need campaigns, we need a movement. Yeah, but we got to have campaigns to spur a movement. And I think that, um, you know, what's what was so inspiring to me is like when you sit in these rooms of people that, um, you know, five years ago would have never been in the same room or five years ago wouldn't even have thought about climate change. You know, when you see plumbers and pipe fitters and electricians and seafarers and um, all these folks coming together to figure out what can we do um, to, you know, to, 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 to create these new jobs and create these new environmental technologies and how can we play a role? Um, to me, always the most inspiring thing about our labor movement is it's just like working people who <laughs> go to work every day who are taking responsibility for making these changes in the way that we live our lives. And I just think that that kind of grassroots um, uh, seizing of the uh, moment is what's the most inspiring and hopeful to me. You know, uh, as long as uh, as long as I see our members out there engaging in these conversations, in tough conversations with each other, and coming out of it united uh, to make the changes that we all know need to happen, that is what um, that's a good alternative energy for me. So that's uh, that's what inspires me. When you were growing up or arriving in your career in the labor movement, who, who were the labor movement leaders you looked up to, Rick? Well, there was this one woman who was a secretary in this movie called Nine to Five, who I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then, um, <laughs> um, um, you know, when I first started, it was, okay, so I'm old, all right. It was in the, uh, in the uh, 1980s and then into the 1990s. And... Um, obviously, the great boycott and Cesar Chavez and the way that they created this whole movement of um, rallying the public behind um, a struggle that was so just and necessary was really powerful to me. Um, you know, growing up and hearing about and learning about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and how when he was shot, it was in the service of striking sanitation workers in, um, in Memphis. And just the notion that... Um, that, that, that the labor movement had the capacity to speak for workers everywhere and struggle against injustice everywhere. And I think that that is kind of the spirit that I think we try to bring to the movement here in Texas of understanding that fighting for immigrants um, and immigrants' rights actually makes all of us stronger. That um, you know, fighting to clean up the planet and create new jobs makes all of us healthier. Um, you know, just this notion that fighting, you know, that, that we have a responsibility uh, to, to make the world around us better. And there's so many examples of that um, that we can draw on that, that kind of lead the way. Do you want to add anything to that, Teferi? Yeah, um, we had um, a funeral service to one of the labor leaders who inspired me the most. Uh, um, uh, that was uh, Jan Sweeney. Um, uh, not Jan Sweeney, um, Jan Sweeney, the president of the AFL-CIO inspired me too, but his lead up to that, um, uh, uh, a white Irish guy in New York um, who cared the most about domestic workers, uh, who cared the most about um, janitors and, uh, you know, a president of ACIU and risk the treasury of the union talk to Ali Kreit, the Justice for Janitors movement, which inspired millions of people around, you know, around the country. And um, um, I was just out of college and in Los Angeles from Sanctuary City to downtown LA, just watching mostly immigrants, janitors with their brooms in their hand, marching on Wilshire Boulevard, demanding justice at their workplace, not just marching, but winning a contract, over 10,000 of them. That inspired me and just drove me to say, this is where I want to be. And, uh, and for forever, I'm grateful for John Sweeney and his vision. Yeah. What gives you hope? Um, what gives me hope is activists. What gives me hope is regular people uh, 
despite their busy life, despite their, um, you know, their busy family life, who care enough to actually are demanding justice. Um, and I'm seeing that everywhere. Um, uh, what gives me hope is Greenpeace and its activists uh, who are seeing the bigger picture of uh, uh, that if we organize communities, if we build, build, build people power, that we are stronger than Exxon and Mobile uh, uh, and, and, and Chevron. Uh, what inspires me is people like Rick, Rick Levy, who in the heart of Texas, uh, imagining the impossible could be possible and actually trying to make change in deep red Texas. That inspires me and that gives me hope. Hear, hear. What, what about you, Rick? What gives you hope? Uh, the power that we all have together by working together. Tafari, um, you know, Tafari showed us in a lot of ways, not just as, as a national officer, but he, you know, he's, he, I don't know if you've noticed, Jane, but he's kind of a modest human being. He did not talk about the fact that when he was elected to one of the top three offices of the National AFL-CIO, that he saw the potential that could be Texas and invested very heavily personally um, of his own time and his own effort to come down here and work with us to create the structures and the systems that he knew were necessary based on his life experience to be able to change things. Mm -hmm. um, and so having done that, Tafari, I just want to say thank you to you. But I also want to say that that kind of vision of understanding that the way things are is not the way they have to be that if we can get that across to our members, that we do have the power to change things. We have the power to make it different. And we only have that power if we use it. And so as I look around and I see the folks at Starbucks and I see the folks at Apple stores and I see the folks at working in nonprofits and I see the folks in hospitals and I see folks all over this country saying enough is enough, um, you know, let's go, let's, let's, let's fight together. Um, you know, it's not guaranteed that we'll win, but it's guaranteed we'll lose if we don't fight. And so um, people's willingness to do that is what gives me hope. It really does. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom, your perspectives, your insights. I'm so grateful. This, this is one of the most important subjects for the future of the i know this sounds weird but it's for the future of the planet <laughs> this, it's, this coming together of the environmental movement and the labor movement this is it jane it's so that you know it's to make this happen when, when you say that and the way you laid out the whole beginning to this thing it's it's just so clear that this is the path we have to be on and just thank you for raising your very considerable voice in this moment um, on these issues. I feel like, um, you know, there is a growing understanding in the environmental movement about the importance of labor and vice versa. And it's up to all of us to continue to do that. If um, So thank you for that and having us on. And if people do want to see more about the Texas Climate Jobs Project, we have a website. I think y'all can find the link to that. Um, if people want to contribute, they can do that too. You know, we're we're, uh, we're just trying to build it as big and broad as we can. And just thank you so, so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about it. Well, with Teferi's help this fall, we're going to be there. We're going to okay. go to Texas. We're going to go to Let's the go. Gulf, which is suffering so bad. And yep. we're going to try to make this a reality. That's thank so you. so great. We, we unfortunately, we don't have time for audience questions. But right. again, I'm so grateful. Um, we have to really understand how how the climate and labor are inseparable when it comes to building a, a better world and That's building cool. movement power. Thank so, you, Jane, for doing this, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need politicians, too, who put people and the planet over corporate power. And when they do that, we have to support them in, in whatever way we can. You know, last month, Greenpeace launched a campaign to write and send personalized letters to climate voters in key races. Do you know that personalized letters have been shown to be one of the most effective ways to boost voter turnout? 
it's it's easy and it has an incredible impact and boy do we have to boost voter turnout this uh, coming up to the midterms election and and hopefully this horrible leaked memo from the Supreme Court is also going to help mobilize voters, but we have to do that. And Greenpeace is on track to send 25,000 personalized letters to voters in these districts. And we need your help to reach this goal. It's going to have a major impact by getting voters, climate voters, informed and to the polls. And you know the drill, firefighters, to make change, we got to take action. So visit firedrillfridays.com slash take action and sign up to join the team. It's all the time we have for today. And of course, if anyone wants to know what we wanted fire drill Friday in 2022, you got to tell them we need President Biden to declare a national climate emergency and we need him to do it now. Have a wonderful month. Be sure to follow our social channels for updates. And next month, we have a really very special show. So be sure to tune in on the first Friday of June. That's June 3rd at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's June 3rd at 11 a.m. California time. I'll see you next time.